My name is Roxanne Pires, and for those of you who I haven't met or who don't know me, I'm the sales manager for Business Print at Epson Southern Africa. I will be your host and MC for the first uh, Epson Women in Business Seminar Brunch um, in South Africa. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, it's really exciting to see that everyone's come out. Um, today we will be honoring the incredible woman who successfully navigated the challenges we face in the working world while balancing work and home life, and surviving the challenges and, cha and, uh, challenges and changes COVID has made in our lives. It is a dream and an aspiration of mine to make a difference in the lives of women in South Africa, and I hope that today we can make a difference in yours. It is so wonderful for you all to join us. Before we get started, just some housekeeping. Um, you can find the ladies' bathrooms if you go out the back door to your left, past the selfie wall, down the corridor when you get to the reception. Turn right, left, left, left at reception to the, to the ladies. If we could put all our phones on silent just for the duration of our, of our discussions today before we head out for lunch. Please feel free um, to share your thoughts on today, um, any pictures you want to take um, um, on social media under the hashtag Epson, the future's female. Today, unlike many of events of this nature, um, is a very informal platform. I want us all to have a chat, go through the good and the bad um, and the ugly um, of what it took for us to get where we are today. Um, and bring lightness into a challenged adventure that we've all faced over the past 20 months, but also some realness and some tips that you can take forward. Please don't be shy, um, and if any time you have any questions for either myself or our, our speakers today, please raise your hand, um, and we can, you guys are welcome to ask questions. So, on the couch with me today is Sam Wright. Uh, Sam Wright is one of South Africa's top female esports shoutcasters. And for those who don't know what an esports shoutcast is, it's an esport commentator. Um, she is the founder and editor of Tech Girl, um, a leading online tech and gaming blog for women. Sam has worked in Europe, China, and Africa on various titles um, as a host and a shoutcaster. She has cemented herself as a prominent voice in, competitive, in the competitive gaming space and has worked with reputable brands such as Blizzard, Nintendo, PUBG, <laughs> and Red Bull. She, she was also the brains behind the all-women gaming events such as Acer for gaming and the 2017 Valkari Challenge. Her passion for esports and technology has driven her to become one of Africa's leading voices in the gaming and technology space. Also with us is Nikki Robotham. Uh, Nikki is the author of Seven Steps to Finding Flow. Nikki is a leader who has worked with many highly motivated and driven entrepreneurs and professionals looking to fulfill their potential and live their best lives across the board. A recent health crisis motivated Nikki to explore how her environment energy, and nervous system all affect her well-being. Using this experience with countless scientific research and the support, of course, of incredible women around her, she has managed to restore her health and well-being. As a result, she's come to realize and understand the role of energy in creating a balanced work and home life and has used the strategy to help countless professionals in the business space. So, Sam, if it's okay with you, I'm gonna throw it right out there. I find your profession so interesting and my boys really can't wait to meet you one day. <laughs> How do you juggle being a shoutcaster, gamer, and run an online application, uh, on publication, sorry? A lot of Red Bull and no social life, basically. Uh, yeah, I also get bored. So for me, I've got to be busy all the time. And I don't have children. I don't know if I could do this if I had a family, I'll be honest. I'd, I'd yeah. have to drop something. 
probably the children, which wouldn't go <laughs> that well. <laughs> cool. Um, Sam and Nikki, on a, on a personal note, how did you handle COVID and juggling being at home, probably trapped in an office with your significant other or a family member or a dog or a cat? Um, I've personally felt the added responsibility of homeschooling, juggling back-to-back -back meetings, and of course my mum, who I'm blessed to have live with us, move into my office on a regular basis to steal sweets off my desk, commit teams, camera on. Um, Nikki, how was this experience for you before we, before we moved to Sam? Yeah. So I think it really required so much humanity, so much resilience, and so much empathy for everyone. I'm also single, um, but I often joke that I've got 62 kids at work. Um, I run seven tech and ops teams at Investec by day. Um, I run a journal business on the side, and then during COVID, inspiration struck, and I, yeah, I decided to write about my experience and write a book. But I think, you know, I felt a huge responsibility for keeping family and friends you know, their well-being optimal, checking in, making time for them to, to really keep those relationships where they'd been before COVID, but also seeing my team struggle. Mm -hmm. And so as much as there were many times where we had those messy top-knot buns and yoga pants and kids running in with lightsabers being thrown across people's necks, I often said to people, I want to see you, even if it's for the first two minutes on a call, because I can see that you're okay. Yeah. and be able to really check in. So for me, keeping those relationships alive was really one of the most important things that we did during COVID. But I also recognized that the most important thing was to put my own oxygen mask on first, because often we put ourselves at the end of that so energy true. queue. And I was giving to everyone else and starting to really feel run down in those first horrific three weeks that we mm. all remember too well. And I then sat down and went, I think we're going to be in this for longer. So how do I really start to make this work? How do I make sure that I'm set up so it feels easeful? And so setting up a home office, um, I do have a rescue cat that comes flying across my <laughs> desk, but now I don't even react. My teams know, and she just goes across. <laughs> and I think we've become so much closer um, in terms of the people that I, I work with. You've really gotten to see what was what's happening in their lives, the struggle and the juggle for each one of them. Before they'd be showing up at work, they'd be professional and that image of perfection. Yeah, now you so see, true. and I, I do want to share that anecdote because it's one Please. of my favorite. Um, I've got a, a team member who's got two twin daughters and she's just actually had her third daughter. Um, and in the middle of a call, I see this little blonde head come onto the screen and I just hear, Mom, I need a poo. And I just went, so you need to go and sort that out. You just give me a, uh, you know, let me know when you're done with that and we'll pick right up. And I think getting to understand what everyone's dealing with has actually made people so much closer. Yeah. But we also needed to spend time to keep those relationships mm -hmm. because I saw so many teams going from one call to the next with no personal interaction. It was becoming all business. And so we spent a lot of time doing things like you know, picnics where we'd get food boxes delivered to people's I houses. Demand. We'd sit on a, a video call and we'd, we'd find people if, um, with a, a few shots of Jägermeister or something <laughs> on a Friday afternoon if there was talk of work. And one of my favorite moments was we actually got Nick Rabinovitz to come on and do a roast for the team. Oh, wow. Bearing in mind this is a team with a good sense of humor because there was nowhere to hide. He'd stalked everyone on social media beforehand <laughs> and he was, you know, having good fun with people. But you know, when you got off that call and your cheeks ached with laughter, I just went, we need more of that. Yeah, so much you can do, mm. hey. So mm. much you yeah. can be inventive yeah. with, um, yeah. uh, even during that, yeah. that crazy unsocial, unsocial time. Sam, for you? For me, it was a bit different because so for anyone who, if you don't know what an esports commentator is, and most people don't. I'm basically like what Nas Buerta does for rugby. So we sit in a studio and we talk about people playing games competitively. That's actually a thing that happens. And most of it's done overseas. So most of my work consisted of me flying overseas. So just before COVID, I think in the, in the year before hard lockdown, every month I was on a plane going to some sort of international destination. I lived out of a suitcase. 
Then all of a sudden, I, I was in Dubai when the rumors started that we were going to shut down and had to get on a plane and get home. And then that was it. I wasn't going anywhere. So I had to go from living a life of being very social, flying yeah. all the time, never knowing where I was going to be, to suddenly being in a house that I'd had for years and never actually stayed in, which was shocking because it turns out I didn't like it. But <laughs> it was also really difficult because my job is all live. Yeah. So a lot of people, when, when COVID happened, they said, oh, that must be great because now you can work, you know, you can do all of this from home. It's all online. But it was really hard because one, you have a co-commentator who I now can't see, I can't read. Yeah. It's really difficult to yeah. figure out live when they're going to stop talking and we don't want to talk over each other. I don't have access to when I'm interviewing a player, it's very easy for me in a live setting to read your body posture, yeah. see how you're feeling. I've got none of that now. They, I can't even create a rapport yeah. with you. And then on top of that, I'm going to sound like a real spoiled girl here, but I used to fly out. I'd sat down, there were sound engineers and cameramen and production people. There was a makeup artist who came and made me look fantastic. And all I had to do was sit and talk. And it was great. All of a sudden, I'm at home, one, I'm a tomboy, so learning to do my own makeup has been the worst <laughs> experience. I don't know if my, my shirt looks right or if it fits. I used to have someone there whose job it was to say, that doesn't work, let's wear that. But then over and above that, the tech aspect of it, because now I had to suddenly learn to be a sound engineer and a lighting technician and figure out how to use a green screen and light it and do that whole thing. And I felt like for me, for COVID, it was like this massive level up yeah. of having to learn all these new skills and deal with the fact that I felt so incredibly alone because mm. I was so used to just being social yeah. with people and getting out. So that for me was, it was tough being alone, but I loved the fact that like now I understand so much more about the technology so around true. me, yeah. how to use it. I'm a bit worried now that I'm going back to events because I'm like, oh, I kind of know how to do your job now. So, <laughs> you know, but I think that was- Don't a, do it that way. Yeah, don't do it that Does way. It this way. <laughs> but that, that was a big thing for me was having yeah. to learn all of that. And I know like, I mean, you mentioned as well, yeah. like, trying to keep social. I yeah. lost that a little bit along the way, I must be honest. Yeah. I felt very alone, mm, which is yeah. weird because my entire, you know, we all play games online, but at one point I was just sitting there being like, this is weird for me because I just yeah. want to go and see a person and, yeah. and interact with them. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I have to ask you, is the gaming landscape changing to recognize more female gamers, shy casters, content creators? Is that, is that happening? Is it starting to happen? Is it not happening at all? What's happening in that space with females? Are we jumping straight into the, the serious yeah, yeah, conversation? Yeah, let's go. Let's go. <laughs> so, I mean, how many of you have kids that play video games online? How many of you have heard about the toxicity online with video games? I mean, it's not, I, I'm, I'm gonna, it's 100% true. It's a very toxic space. I think when you put a screen in front of someone, it, it becomes really nasty. And what's scary for me as well is, is how many middle-aged men are like the worst people online to play games with. I'm not even joking. Like, it's scary. They're the ones, I've heard them shout at children. And they know they're shouting at children. Yeah. And it is a very, it's a very difficult one because for, I would say, I play games all the time. Yeah. And I would say I'd be playing for maybe four or five hours and I'd get one person who's sexist, um, but that's the one I'll remember. So yeah. people will say to me, is gaming sexist? And I'll remember that one time. There's lots of positive mm. players yeah. and, and spaces, but there is a lot of sexism and racism yeah. online. And in the industry side of it, when I started, the amount of drama and chaos, because there were none of the men wanted me in there. They, they made it very clear. I got mm. told... When I started, I got told I was too pretty to do this. You couldn't have a pretty girl. I, someone else told me I wasn't pretty enough. Then I had the same, co this was my favorite conversation is every time someone heard that I was an esports shark caster, I had to answer s like 70 questions, like ridiculous questions that no one knows the answer to. Like which was the developer of this game in like 1995 who left after designing that? And I was like, do you know the answer? <laughs> yeah, because yeah. I don't. And I mean, yeah. I had to ask, I had to be, so much more knowledgeable than anyone else in the room in yeah. order to be considered welcome. And over time, I think that started to change because more women like me have stepped in. Uh, but I, I do think we've still got a really long way to go. Yeah. Just recently, we heard all the allegations that one of the biggest developers in the world about the amount of sexism that was going on there, how uncomfortable women at Blizzard Activision felt. 
And I was like, well, saw that coming because it happens. It's mm -hmm. still very much a, a male-dominated industry, and it, it is really difficult for women to get a foot in the door. I like to say when I started, they were all sitting in a boardroom at the table, and they wouldn't let us into the boardroom. We've since knocked, we've been able to bash the door down, and now we stand in the corner of the boardroom shouting, but they won't give us a, a chair at the table yeah. yet. So, so it's got such a long way to go, mm. but there's so many women now standing up. Before they were, I think a lot of women are, are afraid to use their voices because it is hard. I don't like dealing with it all day, every day, mm. being told, you know, obviously you, you must be sleeping with someone to get you or you don't know. And yeah. you know how it, all yeah. the stories we've heard. Um, but more and more women are starting to go, actually, you know what, we, we don't care anymore. Like yeah. we also want to play. Great. But it's a long way to go. Yeah. yeah. Next, along the same lines. Are you noticing any shifts in the corporate space? I'll be honest. First up, I'm very fortunate to work at a workplace like Investec, which mm. really promotes, you know, women and flexibility and giving us the space um, to be able to do things and work our roles in a way that, that works for us, which I think is incredible. But I've worked at a number of different corporates within South Africa and overseas, and it's not always the same there. Yeah. But I am post-COVID seeing, when I say post-COVID, we're still kind of in it to some extent, but post the, the main part of it, I'm definitely seeing a groundswell where people are recognizing that women are looking for something different. Mm. And they're no longer actually asking for it. They're saying, I'm going to work at a place that honors what I need in order to show sure. up, that honors the fact that I'm not just like any other man. And even though a lot of workplaces are very male-dominated, I think they're starting to recognize the space and the flexibility and how we can show up and actually add value in different ways, but it actually makes what we deliver so much richer from that perspective. Yeah. But I do think we need to see far more around creating these opportunities with the kind of space that women want. Mm. That's the biggest thing. We shouldn't be saying that in order to succeed, you have to do it as a man did it. I think we, we, we need so to be good. able to have yeah. roles where women sit actually, that's what I want to go and do. That's what's lighting me up. Yeah. And I think I can add value to that. And I'm seeing more and more women putting their hands up for that and actually then helping to create those roles, mm. but also having other women hold the door open for them, to your earlier point. Yeah. And I think that's something I'm so passionate about is growing you know, young women. And, and often I see them very hesitant to take that leap of faith, thinking that they need to have the 12 mm. out of 10 attributes, mm. whereas a guy will go, I've got five of those, let's give it a bash. Yeah. And, and I think we, we need the trailblazers, and it's hard, but then we need people to actually hold out their hand and say, I know it's hard, but I'm here, I'm a safety net, I've got your back, mm. let's go. Yeah. And I think the more we start to see that, the more we start to see women have faith in themselves and ask for the pay that they deserve for the role, to do the same amount of work. Mm. And, and I mean, this year has amazed me. I've loved, I've actually got goosebumps just saying it, how many women have stepped up and said, actually, if you want me to do that role, that's what you're gonna pay yeah. me for it. Yeah. And that for me is just the most phenomenal sort of groundswell coming through. We're no longer waiting for someone to give it to us. We're basically saying, I'm here, and I think yeah. I'm gonna do a phenomenal yeah. job. And, you, and, and you're so right. I mean, we, we've recently onboarded a, a, a massive customer, and I'm in, I'm in business mm -hmm. print, which is printers. Most people find that yeah. incredibly boring. I find it extremely exciting. Nobody really understands it. Um, but <laughs> we, we, <laughs> we, we, uh, we recently onboarded a, a quite a massive um, office automation partner, and we were, we were traveling, and... Um, we, we were doing the, the, the technical training aspect of, 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 of the printers, um, and we were just doing our rounds and you know, meeting all the technicians. I cannot tell you how many women technicians yeah. were on that training. And they love it, and they're passionate about it, and they own it, and it's okay. Yeah. And to me, that was so enlightening, because yeah. choose what you want to do. Mm. It doesn't matter if you're a girl. It doesn't matter if you're a woman. Choose what you want to do and go get it. So how have successful women like both of you, Sam and Nikki, um, managed to defy the odds in both of your profession, pro professions? Being in IT, naturally a male-dominated industry, I spend my time you know, trying to keep up to date on trending trends and how I, as a woman in business, can add value to my client la landscape 
by building strong relationships um, with women. Is it is it the same? Is it the same for you? How do you defy those odds? We know they they exist, but how do you how do you deal with them and how do you push through them? I think for me, I mean, I'll jump in. I never knew that those odds existed. I grew up with a, a father who was he was very involved in in tech. I mean, that was where he was, but he never once made me feel like I could be anything other than whatever I wanted. And in fact, mm. I think I disappointed him because his dream was for me to be like some weird aeronautical engineer. Like that was, <laughs> he was pushing that well, all the time. close enough, gaming. Yeah, he wanted me to be like full on in a lab doing whatever, building airplane, I don't know. He was constantly pushing that. And I only realized that being a woman, I don't want to say was an issue, but it isn't, but, but was created as a, a social issue. When I went to Varsity and suddenly everyone was like, oh, but girls don't do that and you don't do that. And I was playing games and I mean, my dad taught us how to build websites when we were like 13, 14 and everyone was like, oh, but girls don't That's do insane, that. Yeah. And he'd never once made me feel like that, which, which I think is important. And then when I look back in it, throughout my career, I always found really strong men who never once made me feel like I couldn't do it, but were very good as mentors in saying, by the way, though, I think you can do this, but you need to know that this is the landscape you're dealing with. This is mm. the type of men that you're going to probably have to face up against, and sometimes women. And this is, you need to be completely committed to what's coming because mm -hmm. it won't be good enough to be five out of 10. You need yeah. to have 13 out of 10. Yeah. So I do think having mentors was really good, but as time's gone on as well, finding other women, uh, that's my biggest thing is, and I, I, we, we have actually spoken about this before we started, where there, there's, two, there's two things that happens, especially in, in male-dominated industries, where either you've got women turning against each other, which I think is created by the men in the room. That's my argument. But sometimes <laughs> you find that if it's a male-dominated industry, the, the few women in it are always at each other's throats. And I do feel like that, that's kind of created by the, the industry and, and the men are a bit worried, so it's, it's easy to turn you against one another. But when they come together... That's helped me a huge amount yeah. as I've gone, is finding other women in my space, banding together, sharing advice, helping one another. And we always talk about this, and it's very like kumbaya, like, oh, women get together. Yeah, but yeah. it does work. When, it does. when we're together, we do far more than we could ever do sure. on our own. So that, that, for me, I think is, is the easiest way to navigate it, is find strong partners, whether they, they're male or female, strong mentors. Yeah. Um, and there are some... I mean, I feel like I've been man bashing the whole way through here, which is not my intention. Because <laughs> um, there's like really f fantastic yeah. allies mm. in, in men. Absolutely. But they're also honest. I think that's the most important yeah. is they say, listen, I can see what's going on and I'm trying to do my bit to change it, but you need to be prepared to, to sure. face off against this as well. Yeah. Sure. Next. So, Sam, I agree with you 100%. And you actually just took me back to growing up, and you're going to laugh, I'm going to reveal my age. I grew up with a Commodore 64. Um, <laughs> So when you're talking about gaming, I was like, I just love that you know that. I'm so proud. Yeah. What is that? Like Mario Brothers? And well, stuff. Mario Brothers oh. and things like Parker Frogger and all kinds oh, okay. of. I think there was like Tetris. summer games and whatever else. <laughs> Everyone's a gamer. They just don't. Know. <laughs> um, but my sort of support growing up, where I learned to take on the world, was I had so many friends growing up where we just, I think we were always outdoors. We were climbing trees. I was crashing go-karts. Mm -hmm. So my gaming was more in the real world, getting very muddy and scarred knees. I have plenty of that to, to go around. And, and I think to that point, there's such a pivotal role we have around how we raise women nowadays. Yeah. We have to get them out there, encourage them to give it a bash, swing for the fences, mm -hmm. and what's the worst that could happen? Mm -hmm. Well, didn't work out. Moving along, yeah, let's try sure. something else. Totally. And I think that is such an important pivotal point because I see the timidness in the women that haven't been given that backing growing up. You can see them looking at a situation going, I want that. And normally I'm the one shoving them from behind going, go and give it a bash, you know, we'll make mm. it work. Um, I've built a lot of female teams within my space to the extent that I actually got told by HR, <laughs> diversity is male too. <laughs> and so I know I've got a lot of guys in my team as well because I do love the different perspectives that come through from that perspective. And I'm always making sure I say to people, my role here as a leader is to be completely dispensable. And that's when you can see people looking at me completely back, I've lost the plot. I want them to succeed. I want to be put out of my job and I can move on and do something else. So good, yeah. And, and I think that collaboration over competition every time is amazing. Sure. And you will, I have encountered one or two women who didn't support, 
we were talking off to the side, and I just really have decided to sort of tune that out, put my noise cancelling headphones on, and just keep going. Yeah. Because if you listen to that, it feeds into your internal dialogue, it becomes part of your sort of thought process. Yeah. But I also think bringing those and finding those incredible female and male mentors gives you such a richness in perspective. Yeah. I think one of the reasons I've been so successful has been having this incredible strong um, male boss, and I won't say behind me, he's standing at my side. So I always know that if you know, the, the pawpaw hits the fan, yeah. you know, he's gonna be there and he's gonna be supporting me. And he was the one who backed me for one of my, my biggest opportunities. And, and I think growing up as I did, he came to me and he said to me, do you wanna build our life insurer? And I looked there and I said, I don't know anything about life insurance. And it was like, neither do I, don't give it a bash. <laughs> and I literally just went, okay, I'm gonna back myself. I know tech, I know ops, I know process. We've got the experts coming in around the business. Let me give it a bash. And we were able to build that in, in eight months, Amazing. which was just so uh, good. Definitely not so good for my stress. <laughs> um, but it was one of the most incredible opportunities that reminded me that we can do anything that we put our minds to. Yeah. And you know that business now we've grown in four years from we started with five of us, we've now got 55 of us. And Amazing. it is predominantly female. Which Until age, I, I complained. I, but I have, to, <laughs> I have to give kudos to our CEO. He's also hiring females, he, he loves yeah. them. He says they, you know, that we've got such a richness within that, within the organization as a result. Yeah. So I think for me, it's just that intentionality around supporting other people. There's more than enough to go around for each and every one of us. And I think we get more when we support the person sure. standing next to sure. us. And you know, you say that now and, you, and, and you've both spoken about relationships mm. and, and mm. mentors. And I, I really feel that some, mm. something that's missing from the workplace is mm. we go there, um, we put on this face that everything's okay and everything's working and we have this perfect life and check us, we're succeeding or we're having a tough month, but it's okay and collaborate as a team mm. to, you know, maybe make the number or whatever the case may be but there's actually stuff happening behind those faces. And if you can find, I mean, we spend all of our time with the people we work with. I mean, really, I spend two hours a day at the most at the moment with my family. So it, these, these pe people, not only women, men as well, that we have at work, yeah. find somebody that you can trust that has maybe gone through something that you're going through as well in your, in your personal life, mm -hmm. you, you have no idea what people are going through. Um, find someone you can trust, lean on them, yeah. work with them. Mm -hmm. it, you just don't know the difference you can make in somebody's life just to get them through to the next day. Um, so I find that very important. Do you not find, I mean, I was just gonna ask, don't you find it weird though, like emo the, the concept of emotion is yeah. seen as a weakness. Yeah. You know? So you can't have, a breakdown where you just go, I, I'm completely overwhelmed. Done. It doesn't mean yeah. I can't do my job. It doesn't mean I'm not good at my job. I'm just having a day where I just feel like this is too yeah. much and be able to have that breakdown to your colleagues without yeah. people yeah. calling you emotional. Yeah. And I, I mean, I worry that we've kind of dehumanized people mm. in the workspace sometimes, women and men. Absolutely, I mean, I cry for everything. <laughs> I cry when I'm happy, I cry when I'm sad, I cry when I'm angry, when I'm irritated. I, I, I cry all the time. Um, I'm just a crier, you know? You know some, some girls don't cry. Yeah. Um, but you are 100%. We've attached emotions to a weakness, especially in business. Um, and why can't we cry when we win a deal? I mean, let's cry, flip. It's, I'm so happy I cried. But it's like, they say you must be passionate about your job. That's an emotion. So I'm like, 100%. Oh, I'm passionate, yeah. but sometimes I can also just really yeah. be annoyed with everyone. Like it should be allowed for us yeah. to, to agree. be human. 100%, 100%. Uh, Rox, can I just share one anecdote please, on please that? Please, please, please. Um, this boss that I've referred to, we were going into a very tough conversation and I managed to just, I didn't want to break down in the conversation. <laughs> so and so I was just like, okay, I've nailed the conversation. We've had the, everything went fine. We walked out the door. And he looks at me and he says, I've got a tissue in my pocket for you. <laughs> you and I just went, <laughs> I was like, no. I was like, and that, then I was just waterworks. Yeah, and, and, yeah. But I love the fact that, you know, you know, even men can support that as well. Yes. And I think for me, we, we need to make it okay. Yeah. We really need to normalize the fact that showing your emotion is actually, especially as women, it's part of our superpower. 
if everyone is just, you know, sort of completely like, you know, you know, one emotion, that's it. 100%. You're not bringing your best self to that, to that work. And we need, it's that passion. We need to normalize it for men too. Because how do we know that there's men out there that are not criers? Yeah. You know? They like, are. They've been told it's since okay. They were, just cry. They've been told since they were little boys they're not allowed to. And mm. I, well, I just think 100%. that we, we've got to change that. So... Uh, next, in your opinion, are brands, so I know you've mentioned this, okay, yeah. when I say brands, I mean like yeah. brands all over South yeah. Africa, so no one in particular, you have said that you've started to notice that that is yeah. starting to happen, yeah. okay, um, especially within, yeah. w within your corporate space yeah. and with Investec, and, that, and that's amazing, I yeah. mean that's so inspiring. Can we fast track this? Absolutely. We can always fast track it, and I think the more we start to raise brave women will really help. But I think for me, the thing that I've seen within environments, and I work across outside of Investec, I'm very blessed that they support me to do this. I actually work with a lot of women to step into what I call the elegant power. Um, and I haven't told you this, but my second book's coming out early <laughs> next year. <laughs> it's so that cool. title. Um, I don't know where you find the time for the <laughs> writing, but it's fine. Um, but I'm very passionate about women owning who they are and showing up as they are and really recognizing that they've got special gifts that they need to bring to the table. Not try and be a carbon copy of a, another man. We need women to show up as they are. And so for me, that coaching, that mentoring um, piece around really stepping into you know, your natural knowing, your innate gifts, and really starting to shine and bring those through in a way that feels easeful for you, that for me is the most important thing. Yeah. And I'm seeing that is giving women who've got that, you know, they're 80% there. It's just giving them that, that kind of space to go, okay, I'm gonna give this a try. I'm gonna have my own back, knowing that I've packed my own parachute, I can back myself and I'm sure. gonna step into the space. So Absolutely. for me, that's one of the most fundamental things to do to change it as we keep corporates honest about giving us the flexibility that we need to be able to show up in the right way sure. for whatever your situation is, because everyone's different. Everyone's got different things to cope with. Sure. Okay, so we've spoken about these girls wanting to break in, but give us some advice on how these girls that are just on the edge, just like like Nikki said, that are just on the edge and they totally want to do it and they, they watch you and they're so inspired by you and they really want to go for it. You know, what, what kind of advice can you give to, to, to those, those ladies who, who really want to break into the space that you're in? So I get asked this question a lot and I always answer with just do it. That was always my thing. It doesn't, and, and I think this is a, but it's, it's not that easy. But I'm always like, just do it. If you, want to, if you want to make videos talking about games, just switch your camera on and off you go. It doesn't have to, I always say it doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to get done. But the problem is, is that is not the, the mentality of, of most yeah. young women because we're told it has to be perfect. And video games are such a good example because lots of people who meet me presume I must be so good in games and I can beat anyone. I suck at games. I'm not even, I play them all the time, but I'm terrible. I grew up in a family where my dad played. My brother was a competitive player. So I had a family of really good gamers and I sucked. It takes me forever when I play a new game to figure out how it works. I'm dying all the time. I've got to learn the control. And I'm, I mean, this is dead honest. It takes me a long time to get my head around. It's not a natural thing. My brother on the other hand, you can put any game on, he can pick up a controller, a keyboard, off he goes, next thing he's the best in the game. Um, obviously it helped because he used to kick me off the PC growing up. I watched him, now I'm good at analyzing games and that's my job, but at the time playing that's something and for me, I didn't start streaming my gameplay and creating videos and even writing about games because I didn't want people yeah. to know. Because in the beginning when I was younger, I was like, oh, I can't write about this because I suck. Yeah, you don't know how to play it. And it was my brother started laughing at me because he was like, who cares, it's a game. He was like, do you watch a Netflix documentary and go, I can't watch this because it might be too smart for me and maybe I won't understand yeah. it the first time I watch it. <laughs> maybe I'll have to rewind it. Because that's what games are there. Yeah. And that's, I think, being brave. So when I say just do it, I do think it's about creating a space where, where women can feel like, it's also mm. okay to fail sometimes. It's okay to suck at the game and lose. Are you having fun? Yes. I mean, that's why video games are quite a good example of this. But I'm like, are you having a good time? Yeah. Are you laughing with your friends? 
Yes, you might be dying at every, at every road. Maybe you can't get up the hill and you don't know how to jump. <laughs> but are you having fun? Yeah. Because that's what you need to do. So my advice is always, I've always said to, to younger girls, just come do it. You've just got to do it. But they, they have this thing where it's like a zero to 100. So they mm -hmm. go, okay, cool. I want to do what you do. But now I need to be exactly where you are. I was horrible when I started. I watched videos of me a couple of months ago when I started and I cringed and I was, I was deleting them off the internet because I was like, Ugh. <laughs> and they, you know the internet doesn't delete anything so we're there forever. But I was horrible. But I think the difference is, like I said, I had a brother and, and a dad and a mom who were like, that's okay, you just do whatever, you know, yeah. off you go, you go and have a good time. Like you just try. It's, yeah, If you brave. don't do well, yeah, be yeah. brave. Go do it. If you suck at it, it's fine. You know, you can go do something else or we can just keep going. So I think, that's really important. It's how we raise young girls, but also yeah. if there are young women who, and this doesn't pertain to what I do, I think it's with, with anything. Just try. I don't understand why we like, failure's bad. I feel like failure teaches you something so along the way. So good. So basically we have to change the whole world's mentality yeah. on failure. I don't know how we do that, but <laughs> at least we're starting. We're starting today, okay. Um, next in your book, you say yeah. that 70% of us spend our days in a state of stress. Um, in my own life, I relate to this. I mean, I think I spend 99.9% .9 of my time in a state of stress. Um, juggling so many responsibilities and finding myself in a state of being everything to everyone all of the time um, is really, really stressful for me. Um, do you believe that it's magnified for women um, who often have that double responsibility of work and home? It absolutely is. And, you know, to that point, around 70% of our day in stress, what people often don't realize is the stressor doesn't even have to happen in order for you to have a stress response. It's the anticipation of it happening. Mm. So whether you're sitting in traffic, that email comes into your inbox and you just go, oh, that whole stress response with adrenaline, long-term cortisol, yeah. and your, your parasympathetic nervous system going into a state of fight or flight is already happening. I was living in that state, which is why I'd actually put my nervous system into what they call a state of freeze. And when you live in a permanent state of chronic stress, it puts everything else on hold other than your immediate survival. So my body thought I was running away from a lion the entire day. Yeah. Meanwhile, I was sitting at my desk trying to look all serene. That's but crazy. my body was literally going, digestion's not important, reproduction's not important, hair growth is not important. So things were just starting to shut down oh very, very quickly. Goodness. And that's what people don't actually realize is when we stay in that state of stress, it has a debilitating effect um, on, our, on our health. But I think when it comes to women with that state of stress, um, Hans Selye often says that it's not stress that kills us, it's our reaction to it. And I expand on that and say it's also our relationship with stress. And this is particularly where it comes in for women. Because for so long, we've justified our stress. We've worn busy as that badge of honor that I'm rushing yeah. here, I'm doing this, I don't have any time, we're always on. We're not creating that full stop at the end of our day to really yeah. be able to say, actually I need to, to take a few moments for myself. And I think when we start to, to really have that dysfunctional relationship with stress, especially as women, where we've, we've used it as a crutch for so much in our lives, I used it as a crutch to deliver. I'll put my hand up. I should have been at an AA meeting saying, hello, I'm a workaholic. It was completely yeah. where I was at. Um, but, you know, I've started to go, that, that's not who I am. It's not who I am. It was how I delivered, but it doesn't serve me anymore. And I think for me, especially with women, Boundaries are one of our biggest issues. We're so good at bending over backwards, allowing everyone else to take sure. our energy. And I think for me, the biggest thing that I always say to people is wherever you feel that resentment or frustration or bitterness or friction in your lives, that's a sign that you need to set a boundary. Yeah. And it's not being like an electric fence where you say to someone, oh, no, you've crossed my boundary. We need to get to that point where we can just say, that's not acceptable for me. And I think one of the pieces I do with a lot of my teams is I remind them that the biggest myth out there is that someone else has crossed your boundary. We own our boundaries. We've allowed so it to be good. crossed. So good. And I think when we start to take ownership for ourselves and how we're showing up, showing up and what we're allowing to come into our space, sometimes embracing what I refer to as the beautiful no, 
because, <laughs> you know, sometimes saying no is saying yes to yourself. In fact, yeah. it generally always is. Yeah. And I think that's for me where men have gotten so good at being boundaried, at owning their space and saying this is not acceptable for me. But as women, because of how we've been brought up, because everyone else has to come first, especially as a mom. Yeah. You know, we're so good at putting everyone else first and then we're standing at the back of the, that, that queue going, can someone please give me some oxygen here? Mm. And I think if we, we, we put ourselves first to give to others with a very full energy tank, we're going to give more of ourselves, our best so selves. Yeah, yeah. So by nature, have we got a question? Yeah, a question. Oh, yeah. great, amazing. Oh, we're just talking. Some, just <laughs> shout at me if there's questions. Hi, so my question is actually for Samantha because you said that um, it's, do, are you enjoying what you're doing when you're playing a game? But do you feel that it's important in every aspect of your life and not just necessarily in your workspace but also in your personal life to always enjoy what you're doing? And that makes it easier to cope with the stress in a sense because... If you're having fun doing anything, then it makes it easier to deal with the harder things. So yes and no. I, I do think you have to enjoy what you're doing. But the problem is, I mean, I'll be honest, most people look, like my job, everyone looks at it and goes, oh, you have the coolest job. There are things that I hate about my job. Straight up, like I, I hate that I have to do certain things. I hate, I specifically hate sitting in meetings with proposals. Like I, just, I couldn't, I hate it. Uh, I don't enjoy it. I don't enjoy pitching to a brand or whatever, but I have to do it. I don't enjoy going to gym. Um, it's I'm not something that I'm like excited about doing, <laughs> but I like the way it makes me feel afterwards. I enjoy that feeling. So, so I think sometimes it's, you can't enjoy everything. I try. Like my philosophy is always like, if you're not having fun, you probably shouldn't do it. But I also understand that at, at some point there's things you don't like, but the feeling afterwards will bring enjoyment. Um, I think people would, to, to, Go to your point that you were speaking, that part where I said, are you enjoying it? Are you having fun? For me, the most important thing is in how you behave, whether it be in work or social life or whatever, is trying to stop worrying about what everyone else thinks. So and I do think, because I think that's the problem with, with why a lot of young women are afraid to fail, because for some reason, we have to be very concerned about what everyone else thinks about us failing. That's why we don't like to fail. Mm -hmm. And I know, because I, I have to constantly tell myself this all the time, it doesn't matter if I mess up, and if I mess up specifically in my job, it's very public, so everyone's gonna see it, but I was like, it doesn't matter. But I think we do this as women, we're like very concerned about what everyone else is gonna say if we fail, if our relationship, if our personal relationship ends, we're more concerned about what everyone else is gonna say about that ending because yeah. we're somehow a failure. Um, so I always say to myself, you need to enjoy it. If you're having a good time and, and you fail at it, or you're trying something and you're having a good time, doesn't matter if everyone else is looking, worrying about what you're doing or saying something. I say this every single day I do this, so I don't know why I'm saying this to you, like I know what I'm talking about, but because um, every day I'm like, oh my gosh, stop worrying about what other people think, because I do. But yeah, so I don't think that you can enjoy every single moment of your life and be like, every single thing you do is fun. Um, like unpacking a dishwasher is not fun, but if you focus on the positive every day, I do think it changes your mental space. So yes, mm -hmm. Uh, and I, my strongest advice to anyone, I've always said this, is if you dread going to work every day, it's probably not the right place for you to be going. Um, but I know obviously jobs, unfortunately, you, it's not that easy to just change. But you need to be conscious of like, yeah. if you aren't enjoying it in the long run. So like, yeah. gym's a good example. I don't like going to gym every day, but I like the way it makes me feel. So I'll keep doing it. You've got to focus on, on things like that. Mm -hmm. Maybe you hate your job. But just remember that you get a paycheck at the end of the month and I like the way money in my bank account makes me feel, you know? So I'm always like, just try yeah, and find, so yeah. Yeah, try so find something, yeah. some sort of positive in a world of negativity. And yes, so then yes, I think that your life will be infinitely better. Mm. But it's, I mean, I'm saying this like I know every single day I'm like, oh, it's a miserable time. So I don't know if you should take my advice. <laughs> Not yet. Did that answer your question though? Because now I don't even remember what the question was. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so good at this. <laughs> okay, so that's so crazy that we got that question from you, Ray, because it was my next step. And so, by nature, 
I'm really an anxious person. But on top of that, I'm really outgoing. I'm really loud. Um, I laugh a lot. Um, and, you know, sometimes I'm a bit of a clown, you know, even at work. Um, especially at work, actually. <laughs> so so how, how, how does your personal energy contribute to your success in your business? Because for me, I feel like not only does my energy contribute to me getting through my day, but I feel like sometimes, or hopefully, it contributes to other people getting through their day as, as well. So do you, have an, do you feel like that works for you? For me, yes. I mean, I learned the hard way in, about six, seven months ago, funny enough, during COVID. Um, I think lockdown, I don't know if it was that. And I've had this happen before in my life, but this is the more recent example is, I just woke up one day and I was like, I, I was in such a negative space. And I, I hate, like I was reading the news every day. The world is burning. It's on fire. Everything is terrible. People are horrible. I don't know why I'm on this planet. Like that's where I was at, mm. which was a very weird space for me to be someone who loved to travel and was always on the go. I suddenly found myself where I just was so angry with everyone and everything. And it didn't matter what anyone did. And then I was obsessed with my phone, reading all the news all the time. So I just kept taking more and more of this negativity yeah. in. And I woke up and I looked at myself. I'd put on 12 kilos. Uh, my hair was falling out. I was in a constant state. I was in a constant state of stress. Yeah. Never slept. Constantly anxious. Anyone could say anything. Even my yeah. mom could say something completely sort of throw away. And I took offense to it. That's where I was. And I don't think I was the only one. I think a lot of people felt this. Mm. Um, and I had to physically stop. Also, suddenly my work was starting to drop yeah. off. And yeah. I'm a freelancer. So I was like realizing that. You know, the money coming in wasn't, I wasn't getting yeah. jobs as much and I couldn't understand, and I was getting more and more frustrated and I realized it was all me because I am quite outgoing and I'm quite, you know, people always joke and say I behave like a child, but that's my thing. I'm like this fun, <laughs> yeah. bubbly, jump around, that's yeah. my personality yeah. and it was gone and I turned into a really bitter grandma in the space of like a, a few months mm -hmm. and it had manifested itself physically, yeah. um, but also it had manifested itself from achieving my goals. And I had to like take a big yeah. wake up, much like what Nikki said, where yeah. I had to go, okay, I'm going to make time for me now. These are mm. things that I'm gonna yeah. do to benefit me that aren't going to impact my work or anything, but will make me feel good. I'm gonna stop reading the news, which I know is not great advice, but honestly, it helped me a lot. I'm yeah. just not gonna get involved in that anymore. Yes, everything is terrible on earth, but I kind of like the planet, so I'm just gonna stick with what I do. And changing that attitude and getting back to that like bubbly mm. fun, playing games, laughing, giggling all the time, and immediately you saw a change. So I do think it's such a like cliche thing, right? Or so your attitude, just be positive and everything will go right. I mean, it won't, things will still go wrong, but at least when you've got more of a positive mentality, I think you handle yeah. the difficult stuff better yeah. than what I could ever handle it when I was in that negative space. Because yeah. I've realized that I'm one of those people that if there's negative energy around me, I will suck, suck it, it all in, in and yeah. turn into the worst human. So. I've got to focus on being positive, not because life's better, but just because it helps me navigate life better. Mm. Mm. And that's crazy because my next question is, is, is for next, and it was really about what role does your mindset play in enabling women to, to separate yeah. work and home? You know, I personally, just speaking for myself, there is zero separation. Even when I'm at home, yeah. my mind is at work. Um, you know, sometimes I, I, I don't even hear the children, you know, talking to me. They now write me notes yeah. and put them in front of my face. So I actually pay attention. And it's not a good thing. It's not. Um, but we know it's not healthy. But, but really, honestly, how, how, do you, how do we break that? How do yeah. we separate that? Yeah. And, and it's a hard habit to break because it's become so ingrained in us. Um, I often joke with my team um, when, you know, they, we used to be constantly on our devices. And I'd often say to them, but I'm not a heart surgeon. No one's going to die. It's okay if I pick it up, you know, so tomorrow good. or the next morning. Yeah. So but we, we often think that we're like, if we're not there, like we're, you know, we, you know, we're not doing our jobs, we're not performing our best. And I've worked in environments that encourage that. Like if you weren't fastest finger first to reply, all of a sudden, they were like, mm, you're not as committed to your job. Yeah. And now I'm like, phone off, down, thank you very much. It comes back, and I run tech and ops. So, like, there'll be times when I'm on. We've got deployments going. We've got big things happening. 
but I'm very conscious around who's going to handle it, what's going to happen if there's a problem. My team now knows. I don't have a single notification on my phone um, other than some vibrates on my WhatsApp just to make sure I know that something's happening. Mm. But I used to react at every sort of ping that used to come, whereas now I've turned them off, and if there's an emergency, I know I'm going to get a phone call because I've, I've worked with my teams to make them understand that. Yeah, so Because good. if we, we understand that energy is everything, it underpins how we show up, how we walk into a room. You can often feel when you, when you started to, especially since I've started to, when I've released my nervous system back into what I call the state of flow, I can actually feel energy walk into a room. And that sounds a bit woo-woo for some people. <laughs> um, I completely get that. Kumbaya. Yeah, literally. <laughs> but I mean, my nervous system was in that permanent state of fight or flight. And I literally, stress was happening up close and personal to me here. I was triggered. I was reactionary. Half the time, I wouldn't let someone finish a sentence. And I'd already be sort of like, this is going to be my response. Mm. Whereas as soon as I was able to work between, and I still move into fight or flight when I need it for a bigger, big delivery, et cetera, or, you know, to get yeah, something done. Yeah, yeah. But I make sure that I'm intentional around creating those little pauses for potency in the middle of the day or on a weekend or on a holiday so that I can actually just give my body a little like break to go, okay, that was a really bad meeting. We're gonna move on and that's the next thing we're gonna mm. do. I can almost recenter and bring my best energy into that conversation. And now, you know, I can almost see stress coming. I can see how someone's gonna react. And, and you know, it's, it's, it's two seconds, but it's almost like my body can now go, okay, they're gonna react one of two ways. And if they go that way, this is what I'm gonna do. And I've got some very intentional mechanisms that my team laugh at, but they've now started doing it themselves. I had a, a team member walk around the corner and I could just feel he was about to just dump all of this toxic energy on, onto me. And true, true as nuts, he walked up and everything that had gone wrong in his day, he gave to me. And I literally just put my hand up and said, hang on. And I just moved to the side. I've literally pushed my chair to the side and I said, I'm letting all of that crappy energy go straight past so me because none of this is for me. I said, you're welcome to let it go, but I'm not taking any of that on. So and I think what we need to be able to do for people is do it in a way that it's not judged that it's them that's the problem. It's maybe how they're releasing their energy. Mm. Now this team member comes up to me and says, no, just gonna have a little rant. You're okay with that? I'm like, go for it. <laughs> and I think for me, it's around how do we manage that energy mm. to be able to, to bring our best selves to our families. Yeah. They want you to be present. They want yeah. you to be, I mean, I've seen the difference with my team and they've actually mentioned to me how much they've appreciated the ease from, the, from my energy now. My nervous system used to feel like this tightly clenched fist mm. rather than a gently unfurling hand. And I can get as excited as the rest of them, but now it's in a way that's not like stressed out and mm. what I refer to as leaky energy. And I think especially as women going into our home lives, we have to figure out how to have that full stop at the end of the day, how to take those walks where you, put, you leave your phone at home and you go and catch up with a friend and we do stuff for ourselves, like going to gym. It's not always fun, but often I come up with my best ideas outside of mm. work because we create limbic spaces, which is where your unconscious comes into your conscious. So all of a sudden your brain is firing, you're showing up better at work, you're showing up more present for your family, everyone's golden. And you know what? You can get to that phone call or that text message yeah. as and when, unless it's a real emergency. Mm. But I think again, it comes back to that intentionality and the boundaries with which we show up. Yeah. So, so off of that, and it's, it's crazy because it's mm. going to flow straight into to the next two hot topics that I have. So mm. the first one is, is mental health. Mm. Um, I feel very strongly about the pandemic mm. that is mental health. Mm. Um, in your, in your mm. opinion, Nix, how, how serious do you think it is how can how can I so how serious do you think it is in South Africa mental health firstly um, how how can you advise the audience to identify it within themselves um, if they're experiencing it and if they're not how can they how can they identify it in in their in their home life so with family um, or, or or within in work and how do we how do we help these people? So I'm not trying to drag energy out of myself, but I am such a firm believer 
that we can save a few lives. Um, so how serious is it, do you think, in our country? I think it's more serious than anyone realizes. Mm. I, I think we are only seeing the tip of the iceberg. And I think one of the most important things we have to do for ourselves and for people around us is to normalize that it's okay not to be okay. Because I think if we see everyone else white knuckling through and putting on that veneer of perfection, it says there's no room for this. Yeah. And that for me is the most important thing, is to normalize that and support people when they do come to you. Because I think, you know, often people feel that stigma, they feel that shame. There is a massive stigma. Um, and, and I often joke with my teams, um, just to make sure that they realize it's okay. And I often quote the, the Italian job, the movie, when, and I can't remember which character it was that says this, whenever they say to me, oh, I'm fine, and I'm like, which fine are you? Fine or freaked out, insecure, neurotic, and emotional? <laughs> and they always go, mm, yeah. so like they've always learned. Like I said to me, just give it to me straight. You're either great or you're in a hole and you need some help, yeah. you need a coffee chat and we need to talk. But I think that's where having your camera on, even if it's the first five minutes, has been, and I've had team members who struggled, that we've put into support and counseling and conversations, yeah. and not in a judgmental way. Often they don't even know I've made the referral. I'll phone our employee wellness team and be like, just a pandemic check-in. Meanwhile, I've already briefed them that I think we've got a problem. Just handle it very, sure. very carefully and very supportively, sure. because it's a person's choice to engage with this. Yes but you can temperature check so quickly with a video on. You can see if someone is looking like, oh my word. And I mean, just going back to a couple of months ago, where Gauteng had just been through the third wave, or we were still in the midst of the third wave and the rioting hit. And I've got a lot of teams sitting in the tell. I've got family in the tell. Mm. And that was the week where I could just tell that like, no one's okay. And mm. it was really around, we dropped everything. We put all of the work to the side. We just spent time talking to each other yeah. and actually saying, how are you feeling in this? Like, how are you coping? How is your family? And I think for me, that's where we really have to get intentional. Yeah. And, but if we, we make space for it, it's amazing it's how work. people yeah. will, will, will share. They um, will share. They will. Mm. Yeah. Sam, do you experience this in your environment? I think I spoke about it earlier yeah, with me. Yeah. I mean, I've been through it. I realized I was in a bad space. I do struggle, though, as well, because sometimes friends, colleagues, mm. I'm, in a, a I'm struggling with my mental health, and then they offload on you. Mm. And I also reached a point where, and I feel horrible saying this, but I was like, I can't do this anymore. Yeah, I can't take mm. all of your stuff. Mm. And sometimes, you know, what, what's stressing them out or putting them in a bad space is something that in my mind, when I'm hearing it, I'm thinking... Mm. So, you, know, you can fix that doing this, this, and this, and that's mm. not that tough, which is judgy, and I don't want to be judgmental, mm. but everyone's battle is different. So learning to respect that, but also learning when to say, no, hold on, because I used yeah. to always be that person for my friends. You come to me, you, talk, you know, they would offload, and that's mm. where I found myself in this place, sitting on my couch, being like, the world is, yeah. is a disaster. Yeah. So I think sometimes you also have to set yeah. boundaries, like mm. you mentioned earlier, yeah. where you need to say, I'm worried about you, and I yeah. do think, because I do think a lot of people are struggling at the moment, yeah. I'm worried about you, I care, I'm gonna help you find someone yeah. who can help you, but mm. you can't offload this, this can't be yeah. my response, I can't carry your burden, I think yeah. that's the most also important. very true. Yeah. Which is hard, those are tough conversations we've all gotta have now, and I think it's been, yeah. I think lockdown's been tough mm. where you've had to say, you know, because mm. I know a lot of people have said, oh, you know, there was, I had friends who they had to have FaceTime calls every day. And if you weren't having that call with them, they were furious with you. But there, yeah. there's that point where you have to say, for me right now, yeah. I can't do that. Yeah. So I, I think it goes both ways of, of also finding ways to protect yeah. your own mental health. Because otherwise you find yourself in a place where you're trying to save everyone else without realizing that you're sinking yeah. so deeper good. and deeper. Completely. So good. How do you do that though, Nikki? Because I need help. Let's go. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> is so, it in your book, by yeah. any chance? Um, there are, there are absolute, it is absolutely in my book, but I think the biggest thing for me is you've got to have that ability to check back in with yourself and almost yeah. temperature check yourself and go, how am I doing today? And even if you do that in the morning over that morning cup of coffee, sitting in the garden, and, but I think it comes back to that saying no. 
and, and there were many times when I got requests from friends after I'd come off nine, ten hours of video calls all day, and they're like, let's do a video call. I was like, oh, hell no. Yeah. I was like, I don't want no video on for nobody. I was like, video fatigue was real. And, yeah. you know, work, you know, because work had gone overboard trying to do all of these things. I was like, I don't want to have video drinks. I was like, I just want to go and sit on my sweat on the couch. Yeah. And I want to Netflix and chill. I want to drink on my own. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm but pretty I sure that's another mental health issue. <laughs> <laughs> but to that point, it's checking back in with yourself and saying, what do I need? And, and we need to reframe putting yourself first. Mm. It's not selfish. Yeah. It is not selfish. Self-love and self-care are the most, well, self-care is the most radical act of self-love, and that's what we have to do. But if we don't spend that time going, mm. how am I feeling? What do I think I need? And don't judge yourself for whatever you say that you need. For me, I think you've just got to feel in and make space for that. Um, again, one of my little woo tricks with my team, which they've now gotten so used to that half the time I'll see them doing it themselves. I just say to them, if you have one of those moments, you just sit there with your hand on your heart and you go, my best is flipping good enough, and it is more than good yeah. enough for right now. Because I think we forget to check it back in with ourselves and actually give ourselves a shout out. Mm. And I am enough. But yeah. I think that temperature check with yourself, and then just, what do I need? I'm going to go and do that. Um, that, for me, is one of the most important things. Rather than saying, what does everyone else need, mm. and then I'll get to myself when I'm too tired mm. to even do that. And you've fallen into sleep, barely eaten well, and put yourself at the back of the energy queue. And so I think for me, it's that reframing entirely to give yourself what you need, because we've all had those moments. But I think, you know, I've also stopped explaining to people why I say no, because I think that's another thing we were brought up to do as women. Yeah. If you say, no, I can't, I'm not available for that function. I know as a, as a youngster, I was like, I can't do that because I've got this, this, and this, and I have to come up with the perfect excuse. Now I just go, thanks for the invite. Unfortunately, I'm not available, and I leave it. I'm not explaining myself anymore. And I've got friends now who know that most probably means I'm sitting on the couch and yeah. watching Netflix. Yeah, that's that's okay. Okay. But yeah. that's exactly what I need because yeah. I do need to de-stress and take that out. My gym time um, is my time to completely get all of that tension out of my body to the extent, and I share the story in the book, I once burst a slam ball at one of those sand slam balls <laughs> at gym. And um, my trainer could see there was just so much energy in me. And I just, you throw this ball down onto the floor. And after three, all of a sudden, the sand just came out of this thing. And she said to me, no one's ever done that. And I was like, well, maybe I needed to get it out. Um, but I think we need to figure out what all of those things are yeah. for us. Don't judge. Do what works for you. Because it's, it's different for everyone. And I think we need to make space for that. You're oh. just going to send me a text and remind me of all of that stuff. Yep, and I'll sure. remind you. We'll just I'm remind you. I'm okay with you drinking day. alone now. That's your thing. <laughs> <laughs> That's your space. That's okay. I'm not worried anymore. <laughs> okay, so my second topic is something that's been hot on the cards on, on you know, okay, well, it's always hot on the cards, but more recently, COP26 and everything yeah. happening um, is the global environmental crisis. As women, how can we influence the acceleration of the prevention of the environmental crisis? Uh, a crisis in our country. So, Sam, let's start with you. Does this come up in your environment? Is it something that's spoken about? Is it noticed? Is it is there any focus around it in your environment at all? This is such a difficult one for me because like I mentioned earlier about my whole the world is burning yeah. thing, which, which hit me hard, and I became obsessed with reading up on all of this. Mm. And it comes up, I find it really frustrating because there's so much information so everyone's saying, you know, you need, to, you need to do this, you need to do this, this is how we need to help it, this is how we need to fix it. And like, I used to get so angry, and I still do, because in, in the gaming space, everyone's very outspoken about how we want gaming, we want technology brands to, to do more, and we want the world yeah. to change. And then we launched, oh, I mean, we didn't launch, but we've been the most involved in NFTs, which I don't know if anyone no, here knows about no, NFTs. We don't know. Does anyone know what NFTs? Okay, no. Basically, I mean, I'm try to explain it, but it's like, imagine going to a, I'm going to get into trouble for doing this if anyone who does love NFTs heard me, but imagine going to a gallery and saying, I want to buy the Mona Lisa, and then giving someone a bunch of money, and they give you a slip that says you own the Mona Lisa, but you can't take the Mona Lisa out of the gallery, but you have a slip that says you own it. It's okay. a very confusing thing. I'm not going to get into it, but basically... Much like the, the cost of NFTs online um, and the damage that it does to the environment is insane. 
And I'm watching all these people who will be yeah. so aggressive about how we need to save the environment and how brands need to do more, throwing tons of money at NFTs now. And I get frustrated because I feel young people for me, and I don't know how to fix this. Yeah. Young people are very vocal about how they're worried about these things, but their actions are completely different yeah. to what they're saying. So I, in my personal space, have tried to be more conscious of what I'm purchasing, conscious as well with, especially with gaming and tech products, because people just throw them away. Like, they, yeah. you know, when they're done, figuring out how we can work better, supporting companies that are doing better. But I don't know how to fix this, this problem we have with young people where they are very, they like to shout about it. Yeah. But then if something's nice, do we, do we care yeah, anymore? Yeah, so But nice. I don't know. I, I yeah. don't know how we change it, but I'm very conscious of it. And I'm very scared because I think that like, we won't, we won't feel the repercussions. It will be the next generation that's really going to feel yeah. it. And I don't want to leave a world that isn't great to someone else. But I don't even know how to, how to begin. Even start, yeah. I, 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 think, I think it's important that we bring it up. Um, and that we know that it exists in many different industries. Um, you know, not only the industries that are all over the telly and, you know, in all the news and whatever. Um, but that's the start, okay? So talking about it is the start of us, of, of us putting something together to, to, to try and make a difference. Um, next, how can, how can women in corporate assist in curbing this? Because recently I read, and this is just nuts, mm -hmm. That if an office with an in an office with thirty employees reduce their consumption of hot drinks to one a day as opposed to three, the energy saved would be enough to charge two hundred and fifty million smartphones. That's mental. Yeah. So a similar scenario is is specific to Epson and and what I do in in in, in my work. Um, if all laser printers in South Africa were replaced with our Epson heat-free technology, our country would save 48 million, million rand a year on electricity costs. Okay, so that's 9,000 minimum wage jobs a year. So are we, are, we doing an, are we doing enough in corporate? Like, can we, should we like really just stop drinking coffee? <laughs> <laughs> well, I might argue with you on, on the coffee one because that's definitely one, <laughs> yeah, of, my, one, one of my yeah. crutches. But I think for me, it, like that, that's, that last stat you shared just blows my mind. Yeah. And I think one of the biggest things we have to do is create far more awareness around this. Yeah. And because we're actually, I mean, Sam, to your point, we're not going to feel the full impact in our lifetime. But I mean, if the climate change we've seen this year is anything to go by, Nelson Mandela Bay looks like they're gonna have a dry Christmas without any water. Um, we're starting to see the impacts now. Yeah. I've been very fortunate to, to kayak up in the polar regions and seeing what's happening to, the, to the, the polar sort of areas and what's happening to polar bear habitats, we're in more of a crisis than we actually know. And so one of the things that we need to do more around is create an awareness and then create very easy opportunities that people can incorporate into their and daily like lives. And like relate to, yeah, 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 yeah. Whether it be like plant some speck worm because of the, the oxygen content that that releases back into the environment. And hey, we've got it everywhere here in South Africa. Yeah, totally. To the extent that my poor garden looks like, you know, I've just planted speck worm you, everywhere. I was like, I'll plant some for everyone. Um, but I think, you know, it's those small things. Like how do we save water? How do we change an appliance that's more energy, you know, conservative? But one of the most exciting things I've seen in South Africa at the moment, um, and I'll talk to one of the initiatives that, that I'm working with at the moment, but one of the things that I've seen is just amazing. And I think this is the South African mentality of, um, you know, when, when the chips are down, a South African will make a plan. Yeah. Um, it always happens that way. And talking to a lot of my friends who are farming in the Midlands, the Natal Midlands, prices of fertilizer have gone up four times regardless of the fact that half the fertilizers and pesticides are horrendous for us and we mm. shouldn't be using them, they've been backed into such a financial corner that they have to look at new methods that actually are gonna be game changers for us. So they're all- So by default. By default. Yeah. But actually, they've now really bought into why they're doing this mm. and it's been amazing. They're standing up to these big fertilizer producers and they're going after what we call regenerative farming because basically if we keep you know, a living root in the soil as opposed to these barren fields that just release carbon back into the, the atmosphere, 
we actually absorb all of this carbon. Mm. So we're not relying on a politician who's incentivized by you know, some, some company totally. to, to reduce emissions. We start to create this groundswell and we're seeing it more and more in Africa and South Africa particularly, where people are doing this type of farming, we, we're actually absorbing more carbon into the, to, to the soil. We're using the same land in between, you know, sort of harvests to feed cattle. We just, we're really getting yeah. inventive and using these techniques, which are for me the ninja move when it comes to, to global warming. Mm. And I think we've just got to celebrate more of that. We've got to yeah. say, be aware that when you're buying produce, try and buy from these types of guys because they are producing it cheaply. We've now got to get it into the mass market yeah. from that perspective. Yeah. And so what I love at Investec, we've done something called the class of 2030 and you get a t-shirt. So, you know, been there, done that, got the t-shirt. After you've, they, there's a bit of training that we go through, we sign up to a pledge, you calculate your own carbon score, which horrified most people. So good, yeah. Um, yeah, really I, I, I don't even want to do mine. Yeah. And, and then all of a sudden you get all of these options that are available to you, and granted they make it easy and accessible, but it's, it's not things that they're necessarily paying for. They want you to kind of go and drive this yourself with your family where you start to make these small changes, whether or not it be turning off you know, all of your sockets in your house from mm. that perspective. Mm. Maybe drinking your tea and coffee without boiling the kettle again, because if you've, anyone's got a solar panel, I don't, but I've got friends who do. Boiling a kettle is one of the most power hungry things yeah. you can do. Yeah. And so for me, it's those simple things. How do we, we not waste? rather than just using it as a convenience, but mm. getting intentional now. Absolutely. And I think for me, it's amazing, you know, to your point, young people often say, oh, well, you know, it's important and I'll shout about it, but when it's nice for me, I'll do it here. Those small things add up. And I think we've got to keep reinforcing that. Yeah. You know, if everyone plants a tree or a tomato plant in their garden, mm. you know, all of these things start to pay yeah. off. Yeah. And so I think we, we really have to create that awareness around the domino effect that your daily choices are, make, are having. Yeah. And, and then that it's easy to make some changes. You don't have to go and spend loads of money from that perspective. Yeah. Um, it, the small things add up. Yeah, and I think it, intention has mm. been such a strong word that's come through today mm. in everything we've spoken about. You know, being intentional about the way we mm. think being intentional about what we do for the environment. Um, you know, um, I think there's one word that we can take away today, apart from my hashtag, is, is, is intention. You know, just being intentional in, in everything that you, that you do in your daily life. So one of the main purposes of our event today is, as we know, to empower women in business to follow their dreams not to give up no matter how many responsibilities they're, they're juggling. So Epson was an early advocate of equal opportunity um, in employment in Japan in 1983. The company abolished gender-based pay differences and has since worked to eliminate the gender, uh, the gender gap um, and enable employees to maintain a balance between work and, and personal life. In 2016, Seiko Epson created a female empowerment project team um, in the human resources department that created an environment of support for employees who wanted to advance in their careers, regardless of their gender. So we've, we've, we've addressed that, okay. When I was researching and, 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 and going through, and, and this was particularly for, the, for the, radio, the, the radio interview I did, a study conducted in South Africa in 2018 shows that women are not always considered for senior positions because of their domestic responsibilities, okay. The same study shows that many South African women underestimate their abilities due to years with socialization. We were talking about this just now, and we really have you know, unpacked a lot of that. Stats show that be between the beginning of 2018 to 2020, the rate of un unemployment mm -hmm. in women in South Africa, South Africa has risen by almost 4%, because women in general carry a heavier burden in response to unpaid care and domestic work in the home. And I genuinely believe that women are having to choose home over work, and this is the increasing contribution of the exit of women in the corporate space in South Africa and the time they have available to contribute to our economy. What, what, would, you say, what would you say to the ladies today who are maybe struggling with that choice, okay? I choose both. I have 
the mental capacity maybe at this point in my life to be able to choose both I maybe need to find a bit of balance um, personally it's my opinion due to years of socialization that women have not been raised to be leaders and we've said this and we know this we need to start raising the next generation of, le of leaders whether it's our our nieces or our cousins or our own children we need to start raising the next generation of leaders i have a helper at home she's just had a baby she named her baby roxy for some reason i had an influence of, over her life and this little roxy i have the opportunity to raise as 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 a leader um to build that next uh, generation um what advice Sam, would you give to the ladies who are maybe struggling to, to make their choice? I don't know if it's the right advice to make that choice. And obviously, I'm speaking, I don't have children. No, I sure. don't have. So it's difficult for me. I, I've always said I can't, I can't even understand what it is. But I, I try and always look at my mom. And from my point of view, you know, like, you work to live. You shouldn't live to work. So Amen. if you're finding yourself in a position where the good stuff and it is like works don't get me real we'll work i think all three of us are workaholics on this stage i love my job i love what i get to do yeah but i also realize that i can be gone tomorrow like this mm. um but my family and my friends are still going to be there and i think we need to the, if, if it becomes to the point that you have to you're thinking you have to make a choice between the two i worry that maybe the work is you need to change however that looks because it may be all encompassing. I think a lot of the time we think that, especially for women, that it's, it must be the family that's taking over and all of that. But sometimes I wonder if it's not that they've had to do exactly what we spoke about, you know, 12 out of 10. So you're putting in 12 out yeah. of 10 and your male yeah. colleagues are putting in five out of 10 and you're now feeling it, you can't do 12 out of 10 at work and balance family. Yeah. Maybe you need to look and go, okay, hold on, but do I need to be doing 12, 12 out, of out of 10 at work? Yeah. Because 10, 10, I mean, I'm pretty sure eight out of 10 is pretty good most yeah. days. Like, yeah. you'll be fine. So yeah. possibly taking a look at that and always just, that's something that I've had to be conscious of. It's not the same, but going, you know, you don't live to work. Like, sometimes you you don't have to do that. It doesn't have to be like that. You do have to to focus on that. So trying to make sure that you, you're not doing the 12 out of 10 all the time. Yeah. Because maybe adjusting will allow you to carry on in your in your work life and mm. reach a leadership position. Yeah. But this is far, I mean, there's far more to this. I could go and talk for hours about yeah. all sorts of other things, but we'll just, we'll stick it with that. <laughs> Next. So I was very fortunate to, ha to hear Tuli Madonsela talk while she was still the public protector of South Africa. Amazing. And the, the words she, she said on that stage, I, I can still remember what everything looked like because it comes back to me like it was yesterday. And someone asked her, how does she juggle everything in her life? Mom, public protector, and I mean, man, she was in the firing line of yeah, everything at so. a couple of points. And she said, they said, how do you juggle those balls without dropping them? And she said, I don't. I choose which ones I'm going to put down. Hmm. She's like, what, what is... That was your, deep. Yeah. So and, and like, from, from a public protector, I just went, whoa. Because all of a sudden, it debunked that myth that we have to be perfect and every ball has to be up in the air, as we spoke about before this. And we have to be juggling them all. And if we're not, well, we're not good enough. She was like, mm -mm. some of them are going to be glass, like your family. You don't want to break that. But you might have to say to them, for a few minutes, you're going to be down here. I'm putting that ball on the floor while I go and juggle these things. Then I'll come back and be present with you here. And... I built that into my book in terms of what I refer to as balance is actually a flow within our lives. And sometimes it's not going to be perfectly balanced. When I was building a life insurer, my balance was work, 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 yeah. work, 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 got it done, right, holiday and everything yeah. else that we needed to, to get done. And I flowed back into a very different balance. And I always say to people, your balance has to work for you not for everyone else. Mm. And you don't have to explain it. And it can shift from one day to the next. And if you don't get it quite right today, try again tomorrow. Because no one's going to beat you up if you didn't quite get that right. And, and I think one of the philosophies 
that I bring through because I do, I, I love, you know, sort of finding what I call magic moments and memories in every day, whether it be a small thing from a towel in a bathroom that I think, oh, how gorgeous is that? To Towels in the bathroom are never gorgeous. Well, no, they can be, pla like, I just love small things that light me up. It can be a I've flower. I've never seen a gorgeous, I'm sorry. I've never. Overseas, generally but overseas. But I will look now. <laughs> so I'm one of those people who just looks for small moments because I always say, you know, like, if we're not being present in those everyday moments, moments and making you know that magic within our lives yeah you know we're just rather doing more rather than being more and enjoying everything that's happening for us so always think you know when you're in one of those situations like if it ended now to your point yeah is this enough and I think we have to start getting that consciousness back into our lives um, and you know really start to embrace everything that's happening for us right now rather than everything that's happening in the future or happened in the past, you know, like, let's just get present and really appreciate those moments from that perspective and build a balance that works for you. Yeah. And just flow with it. Yeah. Mm. Thanks, thanks. So we are about to end our session for today. So there has got to be some questions. I need you to stand there. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> the spotlight's on you now. Can you hear me? Karen, oh. she, she loves it. Hey, you love the spotlight, baby. <laughs> it sounds a bit loud. Um, I actually just wanted to come back to that question you actually asked about how do you actually switch off at home? Because I think most people have that, that very issue is that they're constantly thinking of work all yeah. the time. And, and I kind of feel that many times we come home and we believe that the best way to get rid of stress is to de-stress that's our, our natural thing so our de-stress is oh but i just want to lie in front of netflix and i just want to stare at rubbish yeah okay. the problem with that is that if you understand the way the mind is working you're not de-stressing all you're doing is lying in front of the television. Yeah. The mind hasn't stopped working, so therefore the body is not working, st still carrying on working. So mm. exactly what you're talking about. You're still having those feelings of being like stressed out. You're still like nervous. You're still going to bed and not sleeping. Mm. Many times that's why people put a, like a glass of wine in front of them and drink that because then they feel like I can sleep. Mm. And the problem is because your brain hasn't actually switched off. So the best, w sorry, I don't do Can everybody hear me? <laughs> oh, they won't hear you in the video. Oh, okay. So actually the best way, if you're really wanting to get rid of stress, is actually to go back to a point in your life when you realize you didn't have stress. And most people weren't stressed when they were children. If you actually think about it, yeah. you know, when you were children, so like what, what didn't make me stressed? So you have to almost tap back into your inner child. That is actually how you will get rid of stress. Hmm. So what did your inner child enjoy? That's the question. What Mine enjoyed you? video games. So does that mean I can keep playing video games? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So maybe you do get stressed like that. But like, oh, yeah. some people, it might be something as simple as, and I'm going to point to Ilza because I know she does this. It's something as simple as sitting down and coloring in. Mm. Yeah. When was the last time you sat down and actually got engrossed in the colors and colored in? Hmm. Like my child, my inner child, loves um, ice, like I'm obsessed with ice, like I have to have a drink with water and ice mm. and clinking, I love going into the garden, I love recreating in the garden and creating that picture in the garden, that's where your creativity comes from, mm. so the moment you tap into the inner child, you're not trying to de-stress, what you're trying to do is re or, or reactivate your passion, yeah. reactivate your imagination, mm reactivate your creativity yeah the moment all of those pieces in the mind are reactivated you will notice you've stopped you've switched thinking off. about work yeah you and then all of a sudden like you say mm. that's when the thought will all of a sudden hit you yeah. while you're digging in the garden yeah. you know i actually should just say that to that person and correct that yeah. yeah and that's when that's when it flows now you're in a state of flow so so to you, what I was actually saying, the worst thing people can ever do is sit in front of a television. It's the worst thing you can do. Flipping through a Facebook, it's the worst thing you can yeah. do. The best thing to do is say, if I was me now when I was six years old, what would I like to do? Hmm. 
I used to at one stage when I was going through my divorce, the best thing I ever did when I dropped my kids off at school was go to a park and swing. I oh, used yeah. to swing love, yeah. and swing love and swing. I looked like a complete moron <laughs> because I was in high heels <laughs> and I was swinging in these like um, public <laughs> parks. But it got me through those times because yeah. I felt free. Mm. I felt free. And I think my, my, my thing to everybody is stop looking for ways to de-stress and rather look for ways to activate mm. your passions. Yeah. So good. And then work you'll start will seeing, work is just your eight hours after that passion will kick in. And that's when you will find what your yeah. purpose is. So good, see, thank you so much. I just want to add to that, because I, I love that. That, For was, me it's, that was pretty good. Do you want to put it in your book? You've got to ask her that. <laughs> so I've, I've got elements of that in there. For me, it's all about that pause for potency, whatever that looks like for you. But my, one of my favorite ways is what I call the kitchen dance party. You turn oh, yeah. that music on, you oh, dance yeah. like nobody's looking. So. And during lockdown, I actually took up adult Lego. So. Oh, we've got another Lego. What's the difference between adult we, Lego and Lego? No, you, you build Porsches. And I've, I've, my next one is a Land Rover Discovery with full suspension. I actually give them all to my trainer's son once I've built them because I don't want to keep them after I've built them. I'm like, we've got sorry, I didn't know there was such thing as adult Lego. I build Lego all the time. Oh, no, 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 no. So they, they're, they're kind of next level Lego, put it that way. Yeah, we've got another Lego in the yeah. audience. And no, no, I do all the Star I'm, I collect Star Wars Lego. Yeah. I, yeah. I, 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 do, I don't know. It's a bit, so but the, yeah. lots of girls are doing Lego yeah. stuff now. And that also is yeah. like in a, in a child. I don't have the patience for Lego. So. Yeah. Um, there was someone else. Oh my gosh, I've got stage fright. I've just been asked to stand up. <laughs> Hi, everyone. So my question is, so... Um, Generally, I'm the type of person that is very intentional about um, finding the positive um, in every situation. Um, so, and also I'm all about fixing each other's crowns um, as women. Yeah. And um, my question is, how do you, you know, when you come across a person that chances are they don't even realize that they are highly negative people on a daily, they always find negative, there'll be a positive, but they'll point out the negative. So I'm always that person that wants to lend an ear, that wants to advise, what, but I struggle because I believe in kindness in whatever situation, be kind, don't be harsh on a person and all of that. So if you find that this person, whether in your personal life or um, at, at the work environment, and you have to constantly have to deal with this person that you know, always finds the negative in almost everything. Yeah. How do you then, with kindness, without making them feel like, you know, there's something wrong with them? Because, I mean, like I'm saying, chances are they don't even realize that, you know, they are actually negative every day. Every, every day, it's, it's like they are, yeah. So how do you then make them understand that and, and maybe educate them to have a different approach um, um, in, in, in life so that, you know, because then energy, it pours into you. So, you mm. know, it's very hard to just turn your back when somebody is trying to reach out to you. Um, so my question is, how do you then advise them? How do you then get them to a point where they understand that this is not because I'm sure it drains them as well, <laughs> you know, as much as it drains me. So that's my question. Can I just say, I mean, before, because I'm pretty sure, Nikki, you've got yeah, stuff about this in your book, but, like, one of the hardest things I've had to learn in the last year is mm -hmm. I, I can't change people. Mm -hmm. I can only change how I react to them. Yeah. Um, so when you were saying that, how do you get them to realize and get them to... I, you can't change people. Sometimes mm -hmm. they're just horrible or they're negative. or they. But I, I, I don't know. For me, it's you've got to change the way you take that on. You don't have to take that on. Mm. That, that would be my answer, but I'm not the prefer. Nikki has a whole book, no. so like, <laughs> it's not all on this guy. Um, I'm selling uh, a book well here. No, I, I love it. On. <laughs> well, they're all getting a copy of the book. I oh, you're that was a surprise. Yeah, 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 there, yeah. Um, surprise. But, and it's not, the, the, not really, my, um, the book is more about your relationship with stress and how you deal with some of that, that stuff, but it's absolutely part of that concept because, Sam, I so agree with you. Like, some people, like, they feed off their own bad energy and, yeah. and they're going to sit in that no matter what you do and how you nudge them. So I've had this experience personally where 
I just, I felt that every interaction with this, this, you know, these individuals just left me drained, left me like, oh, you just feel heavy afterwards. It's like, like leaden boots. Whereas I think that the people you bring into your life should be, sure, we've got tough times and we work through them together and we support each other and we fix each other's crowns and, you know, that sort of thing. But it shouldn't be every single time you walk away feeling drained. And, you know, you've got to understand how much you value that relationship you know, and how much you want that in your life, because there's gonna come a point where you maybe have to have that conversation to say, I love spending time with you and you're a great person, but I sometimes feel like just, you know, you, you're always bringing sort of the negative aspects and I, I'd love to maybe reframe the conversation. Some people won't even get what you're talking about, that nudge will not even land. Yeah. And you, that's when you've gotta decide, actually, is this an energy I wanna engage with? Because mm. every energy is an exchange. And if we all start to up-level the energy exchanges we have, we're all gonna be so much better for it. Yeah. But there are gonna be times when you can't avoid it and they're not willing to change. Some people in my life, they know, as soon as I just do that, I'm like, it's almost been a mirror back to them to say, mm. this is how I'm feeling to you and it's not easeful. And, and that for me is so important. I didn't realize how I used to feel to my teams when I was so stressed out. And luckily they know me well enough. Mm. And, and you know, they could say to me afterwards, like, God, you, like, just, you, you feel so much more available to us. You, you bring that sparkly, like bubbly juiciness into the office now. And I just, you know, I felt like, oh, how, much, how must I have felt in those environments when I was mm. you know, wired to just deliver at all costs before? And so for me, it's just, creating that mirror back to that person, but being perfectly okay, because it's not our job to govern other people. Some people will, will take that trigger and go, oh crap, I'm showing up like this. Let me just take a walk, go outside, have a coffee, and come back as a better version, a more easeful version for everyone else, yeah. because it's amazing how that energy permeates a room. One person shows up like that, everyone else is just going, oh, yeah. holy crap. Um, so I think we do have to nudge in a way that makes it about the ball and not the woman or the man, as it were. So mm -hmm. don't make it personal, don't get judgy, but be very clear that what's acceptable for you and what's not acceptable for you. Because also at the same time as, and I've had friendships I've had to walk away from, where I'd realized that person was never gonna change, mm -hmm. never. And actually that was feeding them in a whole different way and they needed to do a whole bunch of work and potentially sit on a therapist's couch for a little bit, but. I wasn't going to go and put myself yeah. in that space. I was very caring, I was very empathetic, and I had the conversation. I said, I just don't think this is mutually beneficial anymore. Yeah. It wasn't about the person, it was more about the energy. And you don't have to be everything mm. to everyone mm. all the time. Mm. You don't. Mm. Hi ladies, um, I just wanted to ask, as women, do we still feel the need to be hard in order to be accepted at the table with the boys? Do we celebrate being um, softer, feminine, being um, timid, even though we are leading? I mean, if you look at Tulima Donzela, her voice was very soft, mm. but her actions were superpowers. Mm. They brought the whole kind of country to a standstill with the sta uh, state capture. Did she need to be tough, be jack of all trades, be cutthroat in order for her to be there? Is that what we want to do? Or do we celebrate our femininity? Um, especially with us black women, we, do we always insist I'm resilient, I'm strong, yeah. I am the, I'm everything. Um, almost like you're a tea bag, every time they put you in hot water, you have to release some energy, some flavor. Do we celebrate ourselves that way? Do we still want to be called strong women? We're rushing through and, and end, or do we accept? We are feminine, we are having a voice to speak, mm. and we can be on par as men. Mm. Why are we doing this hardship on each other or on ourselves? Mm. Are we trying to match the, the men? Are we trying to be accepted? Are we trying to get to sit in the boardroom table? That's just my thought. I, th I, I personally think that as much as we would, l would like to go and sit down and be the feminine woman sitting at the boardroom table and, you know, engaging with, with men around the table, 
um, and we'd like to take the approach of being softer and more, more feminine. Um, I often call myself a, a servant leader. I have a team um, that I love and um, without them, I am nothing. So, so in certain aspects of my, my business life, I can show you that softer side, but I still do feel like there is still an expectation on us as women that we, that we still do need to bring that hardness. Um, I mean, it would be great if it, it, it could change, and how do we, how do we, how do we change that? I think, I think we need to continue to make it okay for women to show up as they are and celebrate that and support yeah. each other when they do. And that's why I've used the term embrace your elegant power for my second book. And, and I'm not punting the book by saying that, but I think it's such an important concept mm. that we need to bring through to women. And it's all about embracing your path to success through ease, through who you are. We often think and we often mistake power for force. Force is something that produces a counterforce. It's very much that masculine must kind of energy as opposed to that feminine flow. And I think we are so much more powerful as women when we show up as we are. Mm. That we don't think we have to look like a man in a boardroom and show up with them and be all masculine. Mm. You know, but it also depends on what your own personal energy is. I think we have to bring our own authentic yeah. energy. And when I use the term power, and I, and I love this analogy from a na natural perspective, think about gravity. It moves things around it without even having to move. And that is the power that a woman has within the workplace. So good. When we stand in ourselves and say, this is who I am. If you don't like it, please, there's the door. Mm. And, and I think we need to get to that point where we're unapologetically ourselves because we're gonna be so much richer as workplaces, as a society, as an economy, mm. if we get people to show up with their own gifts. We need to stop thinking that homogenization and you know, cookie cutter clones are the way of the future. Mm. We need to say we need all of this richness, this, you know, the emotions to come through because that's the passion. That's what drives us yeah. all. And, and we need to start calling out behavior where we're being forced back into the box. I think for me, it's time to just burn that box down and, and say we no like longer have a box. Yeah. Um, and I think we need to start doing that for ourselves you know, and supporting other people to do it. And I am definitely seeing that starting to come through. Um, we're saying, actually, that way of working no longer works for us. Yeah. And I think to your point about women leaving the workplace, I've personally seen women leave the workplace because the cost of showing up in an inauthentic way was too much for them. Yep. And I think we need to start saying to women, actually, we need more of that richness. How can we create and support you to show up as yourself? Because we need you to stay in that way. Yeah. Yes, Michelle. Don't okay, don't stand. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Stan, my love, you're so beautiful. <laughs> um, so I don't know if mine's a question or experience or mm -hmm. perspective, but during mm. COVID, I battled a lot with women at home versus women in business. And not that I'm husband bashing my husband in any way, but... Don't worry, it's only being filmed so you can watch it. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny, he knows rocks. <laughs> yeah. um, and we spoke about like turning off and de-stressing. I did exactly that. I'd pour myself a glass of wine, send Rox a selfie and go and sit in front of the TV because I couldn't turn off. But mm. it wasn't just turning off from women in business. It's just I couldn't figure out who I was in COVID because I'm now a woman in, at home and my husband would go and work and he'd come home and the bed wouldn't be made or the dishwasher wasn't unpacked or this wasn't done. And it became this kind of like back and forth of because he's like, you've been all, at home all day. And I was like, okay, but I'm a woman at home in business. Yes. I'm working. I'm working. So I don't know if anyone else felt that mm. where you were kind of in turmoil between do I do my household duties or do I work oh, right totally. now because I'm at home. Oh, yeah. It's, a so, it's like a guilt thing. Exactly. Like you almost feel like guilty because you didn't do all that stuff because most of us didn't have help during COVID either yes, at yeah. home because we couldn't. So half the time mm. I was so guilty because I hadn't swept the floor or put the washing on or even hung the washing yet and it was it was chaos and in between a team's call I was like shit 
the floor. Why, I didn't why sweep the do floor. you have to sweep the floor? Oh, yeah, he yeah, yeah, lives yeah, yeah. there too. This is no, always, no, 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 sure. I mean, sure. this is my, I know everyone's laughing. So uh, my ex-boyfriend was phenomenal at this. Yeah. He, I mean, I think it was just he didn't like the way I washed the floor, but whatever. He would <laughs> clean the floor, <laughs> unpack the dishwasher. And there was an understanding that we both live here. Therefore, we're both responsible. Yeah. But so many of my friends are in these relationships where during COVID, they were like, I don't know how I'm dealing with all this stress because I have to cook and I have to clean and I don't have help. And, yeah. I, and I'm like, but you know, there's two of you living in the house. So true. We just need to change this idea that like yeah. our job is to cook and clean and work. Like yeah. we both live here. Yeah. You're an adult. Make the bed when yeah. you get up. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I say this. I'm single now. So. <laughs> <laughs> and when you're single, there's no one else to share yeah. the workload with. That's the other thing. I just like wonder maybe I shouldn't be being like, well, make your own bed. But I do think that that I can imagine what you were going through because I, I had so many mm. friends who felt yeah. that they were, and then they had to be, they were looking after their kids, yeah. and they were looking after the house. But I, I think maybe, yeah. maybe. You, I think it's more that in my, my husband got to leave the house. So. Yeah, and then you feel jealous. No, but he thinks because you're jealous. at home. I felt jealous. I was like. How come you get to go and be a, what, what did they call the people who essential work? Essential services. Essentials. How come you get, I'm essential. <laughs> but I think because you're at home, that? he presumes yeah. you're doing nothing. Yeah. 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 Have you yeah. sorted that out now? Oh, okay. Train them well. <laughs> yeah. but, but I mean, to that point, it's, it's also just, you know, flipping the script on them as well. Friend, uh, one of my, my friends did that to her husband and basically said, fine, every night's a bra night, you're it. Amen. And he just went, <laughs> yeah. oh crap. Yeah. And she's like, I'm sorry, this is what it feels like when you come home yeah. and say that to me. Yeah. And so all of a sudden they had a different conversation around the shared responsibilities with the environment. And we actually had, we used to do like Monday morning coffee chats to like, at, at work just to replicate what we used to do in the office. Yeah. How was the weekend? What did you get up to? Not that we had as much interesting things to get up to, um, but often we also then share sort of little hacks that we had. I think every one of us invested in one of those robo vacuum cleaners, those oh, yeah, cheap ones. Oh yeah, but mine didn't work. So, you know, I, yeah. well, well, it depends. So mine was wonderful. I called it R2D2. It would get locked in a room and it had to do its job and I'd go and find it once it was you know, done and it had stopped under my bed or something. You just found the things that didn't work yeah. for you and you also let go of it needing to be perfect. And I think for me there has to be that recontracting between so many you know, men and women in the, in the house around what your roles and what your responsibilities mm. were. And I mean, we did see divorce rates go through the roof. That's I mean, I crazy. saw it in teams. And often, it, like I often say, COVID exacerbated what was it, where there were cracks, and it just you know made things incredibly good where they, they were already good. Yeah. So there was nowhere to hide from a COVID perspective because you really got to see the person yeah. that you were with. Um, and so I think for me, it's around recontracting and saying, "Hang on, no, we're in this together." I mean, I had to remind people when I used to live in the UK for five years. No one was coming to sweep the, you know, the floors yeah, or whatever. Yeah. We, had, we had a roster. Everyone had stuff to do. Go. And my 76-year-old dad got put on his own roster. <laughs> he was cleaning the bathroom floors, and I was like, I love it. A man who would never have done that all of a sudden went, actually, I've got to step up and do this because no one else is going to do it. So I think it was getting, again, just I, having the conversation. Yeah, and I also think that it's okay, and, and, and I think married individuals – have it di very different to 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 single to mm. single people out there because you can sweep your own damn floor when you want to sweep it, um, but or not sweep it or not sweep it. <laughs> but I think I think the thing is here is that mm. I promise you the world mm. won't end mm. if the bed is not made. I promise you the world is not your heart might break for a while if if you mm. went through one of those divorce statistics. Mm but I promise you, you're going to be okay. Um, and I think, I think that the sun will shine again tomorrow. Yeah. It's going to be tough, but no one ever died from not making their yeah. beds. It doesn't always have to be perfect. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't always have to be perfect. That doesn't mean my domestic worker didn't judge me when she came back to Oh, uh, yeah, to oh, yeah so she, she was like, mm, Did you ever even do anything? Yeah, no, she, no, she was like, I'm coming two days in a row. <laughs> um, she was like, she's like, yeah, but, but she then saw me working from home before I could get back into the office, walking around half the time with a phone on my ear, my laptop like this. She's me, 
you're way too busy. Yeah. And I just, and I was trying to answer the door, collect parcels. And I think, you know, we really, that's that humanness, that empathy mm. for what everyone's going through. Um, and, you know, that, that kind of juggle from that perspective. And yeah. we just, they always say, if you want to be happier, oh, your standard's just a fraction. <laughs> yeah. The housework during COVID, that it's was absolutely good. It's hard a perfectionist. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, my love. Um, okay, ladies. Oh, there's another question. Earlier we were talking about emotionals, how girls will cry if we're happy, if we're angry, etc. from that. Um, in our work environment, I work mainly with men, um, besides t TJ. We have our good days, we have our bad days. Mm. On our bad days, we often we shed a tear or anything like that. But then you get labelled as a drama queen. Mm. How do you move away from that? I, I, don't, I don't think we... I, I think that label is not mm. going to disappear very quickly. I think we need to be okay with drama queens and own it. It's something very similar. Like, so I've, I've heard the drama queen thing. And then also, I mean, and it kind of ties into one of the questions earlier where, so in my industry, I had to completely change myself um, in the sense that when I got into the gaming industry, I received a lot of, unsolicited attention from men who were telling me they were going to help me. They were going to help get me where I needed to be. There was a lot of that. Um, and when I turned them down, the aggression that I was a bitch and I was this, so I completely toned myself down. Mm. I stopped wearing, I wore jeans, sneakers, t-shirts. I was completely covered up. When I went to meetings, I looked as tomboyish as they come and I became very brash in the way that I spoke. I spoke like a man and I swore with them and I, yeah. I got, because that was an easy way to protect me of going, oh, look, I'm one of you. You can't hit on me. You know, you can't come and do that because that happened all the time. Mm. And I didn't get the drama queen thing, but what I started getting was they would still hit on me and I'd still turn them down and say, I'm not interested. This is a working environment. And then I got labeled a bitch. So I heard that all the time that I'm a bitch, but I was a bitch because I said, no, that's behavior. Mm. I've had to do this. I, I never show my cleavage. I never wear anything that you would consider revealing. I talk like you, I act like you, I'm trying to like fit in. I'm drawing the line here, Yeah. but I was a bitch. And now I've reached the point where I own it. And I'm like, it's okay. If you want to give me all these labels, like you said, mm. so be it. Then I will be the bitch for you. But like, yeah. whatever, like yeah. I can't change again. I can't change the way you see me, but I do understand how much it hurts. And I know with the drama queen thing as well, like I can't imagine that's easy when when there's colleagues calling you a drama queen because you're having a bad day, it's frustrating and it's, mm. it's hurtful. Yeah. And when you're feeling down, it's even worse yeah. to, mm. to feel that way. So, but I do think owning it helps, but I can imagine that sometimes, and also not everyone can be brash and shout back. So yeah. having yeah. to listen to a colleague tell you you're a drama queen when yeah. you're feeling terrible, it's yeah. the worst feeling. Mm. Yeah. And I'd I think, suggest yeah. kicking them in the shins, but I don't think violence is enough. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. And I think, just further to your point, it's important to remember when someone makes a judgment of you like that, it's got nothing to do with you. Yep. It is everything to do with the person making the judgment. And sometimes you've just got to take that to yourself. You either own it, if you feel strong enough to own it on that day, mm. or like you can handle it. You can make a bit of a joke. I mean, often my teams know, because I'll stand up for people. If I walk past and I hear something, I'll be like, oi, none of that. Or mm. there's been times where I've been called, I think a guy called me a bully. And my team were all like, what the hell? And I just didn't even react. I just said, hello, pot, this is Kettle speaking. I was like, because mm. if you're going to give me that, you're, ex you're exactly sitting in that behavior. But there's also times you've just got to drop the mic and walk away. Yeah. and just say, this no longer serves me, thank you very much for playing. Yeah. So I think you've got to feel into wherever your energy's at at that point, but the most important thing to remember, that judgment, someone else's prejudice. Yeah. Someone else's baggage, someone else's trauma. So often now when that happens to me, I sit there and I have a few moments and I just actually send them love from like, n not like verbally, because again, they'll look at me a bit strange. <laughs> and I just go, actually, I'm so sorry that whatever happened to you in your past made you such a bitter and twisted human being. Yeah. And actually, you need a hug right now. Yeah. And I've used that technique as well. I was like, it feels like you need a hug. And they just looked at me. Um, and I said, yeah, I'll give you a hug. Because yeah. clearly that, you know, there's something going on here. And so sometimes you can just diffuse that situation from that perspective. But whatever you do, do it's not let it land. You. Yeah. Do not let it land. 
Also, I mean, if you phone me, I don't work at your office, so I can come <laughs> kick him in the shit. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else have any other questions? Next, I'm going to ask one. Um, yeah. Your book, and obviously, as, we, as everyone yeah. now knows, that they are getting one of your books Sorry. today. Um, what made you write your book? And you don't obviously just wake up one morning going, I'm going to write a book today. I bet you she did, because she, she probably yeah, did. She, I was just thinking the same thing. If you'd asked me before COVID, I was never going to be an author. It wasn't even in my plans. Um, I'd been on this journey to heal from literally virtually almost being hospitalized or having an autoimmune disease. And the universe just sent me the most incredible woman who helped me heal in under six months. And it's a journey that normally takes people two to three years. And once I think I'd gotten my nervous system back into a space where I could actually just engage normally, um, I actually was on a run one morning during lockdown around my complex. And because that, that's the time when the energy starts flowing, I'm moving bad energy out of my body. And I reached a point and I just had this flash and literally I was like, you need to, you need to put this up there. Mm. And all I knew was it was called finding flow about your nervous system, your relationship with stress and bringing more resilience yes, and easefulness into our lives. <laughs> and I literally, I stopped running and I turned around and went back to my place and I sat down and I started writing this down. And then I had that vulnerability hangover and like, oh crap, who am I to do this? Yeah. Like, you know, and funny enough, Gareth Cliff actually asked me that on a radio interview. He says, who are you to do this? You're not a psychologist oh. or a medical doctor. And I said, Trust who Gareth. am I not to do this? Yeah. Because this is my lived experience. Mm -hmm. Most other people write from a theoretical, academic point of view, and man, I even struggle to read those books. So how's a woman who's actually stressed out supposed to take that information yeah. on? And so I really just knew that I was being called to to show up and share my story. Um, and it wasn't easy. Investec is a very hard environment, especially when you, you haven't got the relationships. And here I was going to talk about hiding in a toilet cubicle, going, holy crap, I can't even think straight because yeah. like so much is going on and I can barely get my head to just pause for a moment. Talking about some of the physical symptoms I had, my stomach used to blow up and swell to the extent I had to undo my jeans under, a, under the table when I sat down or when I wanted to eat something. Mm. And then I had to like Houdini them back up in order to get up and have not, <laughs> no one see my red underwear or something. And so I just, something said to me, it's time to share this. It's yeah. time to make this okay. Um, and the feedback I've gotten, I mean, I've had strangers leave me Instagram voice notes in tears, oh, literally just saying so to me, great. and that's when I just knew, I, I was like, if I help one person, I'm it's done, enough. I'm golden. Mm. And, you know, I've really just started to see how much it's resonated with people, you know, who have their own, like, I thought I was the only one. And, yeah. and I think for me, what I even see more than that is how many women I've met specifically who've left it too late and are now dealing with debilitating chronic, you know, symptoms and health impacts that they're having to live with and cope with, but they're often keeping it secret and, and living with it in shame. Mm. When I was healing, only a handful of my friends knew what I was really struggling with. And because you did think like, you know, my body's letting me down. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not being superwoman, that's yeah. what I'm supposed to be. Yeah. And I think for me, as I wrote the book, it literally just downloaded and came from my own experience. I'd done all the research, I'd been working with medical experts, so all of that information was there. But I realized I had to share my personal story because I think that for me is what makes it real. Um, and it was incredibly, especially since Investec supported it, and like I had guys on the trading floor reading this, and I was like, oh God. And then I just, <laughs> yeah, I just let like, it go. I just yeah. went, you know what, actually, I don't it's actually okay. care anymore. You can all yeah. know about this, because it's out there in a book now. But I think for me, it's, it was part of my journey to serve and get the story out wider, to make people realize that actually it's not a way to live. We need to, what I call, unshackle from that invisible straitjacket of stress because it does lock in, us in and it does keep us kept into that cycle, kept in that cycle. But it's not going to serve us. Mm. We need to live our best lives. So, sorry, that was a long answer. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay, ladies, so we've, we've come to the end of our session, but we do have lunch um, out, outside <laughs> now, and, we, and, and we'll, have, we'll have something to drink, so I'd love it if everybody could, could stay. Um, and then, Sam, you guys, you guys are staying, hey? So, so they'll be around if you if you want to ask a few more questions more more privately. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful woman, and I'm just so privileged that I could do this with you both today. So I hope it's the start of amazing things to come. And I really hope that we've encouraged, even if it's just one person today, um, to follow your dreams, to fight, to not give up. The sun's gonna come up tomorrow. You don't have to be perfect, and you can be a drama queen. Um, so please, um, please join us for lunch if you can, and something to drink. Um, and then on your way out, you can collect your goodie bag. Thank you.